It's the beginning of the month, so it is time to do some birthday shout outs. I want to say happy birthday to Hillary, Jessica, Aria, Kalina, Robin, Shelly, Kelly, Amanda, Joy, Chris, and Deborah. Happy birthday, everybody. I hope you have an amazing month and it is full of all the things that you love in this world. And if it's the beginning of your winter or the beginning of your summer, I hope it's an amazing season altogether. Happy birthday! In 1988, a little girl went missing from her home in the overnight hours. The police zeroed in on their suspects, but the prosecution team had a difference of opinion over whether the case was ready for trial. Going to trial before they were ready risked double jeopardy if the person accused was acquitted, and it risked sending the wrong person to prison if they were convicted. I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to Crime Lines. If you're new, welcome back if you're a returning listener. I have started uploading the podcast episodes to my YouTube channel last week. Enough people had asked me to do it, and I couldn't actually really figure out why I wasn't. So if you prefer to listen over there, that is an option now. Just a quick general content warning that this is a kid case. I know some people just do not listen to those. And if you're one of those people, I'll be here next week, or you can use all this free time you have to catch up on all my other content. For everyone else, hi, welcome, let's get started. We are talking about the case of Jacqueline DeWallaby. Jacqueline grew up with her mother, Cynthia, and her adoptive father, David, in the suburbs of Chicago. Cynthia and David started dating when Jacqueline was about a year old, though they had met through friends even before that. Cynthia separated from Jacqueline's birth father, Jim Guess, shortly before her birth, and they divorced soon after. Jim was never really involved in Jacqueline's life. David Dwallaby's mother said he wasn't really a baby person until he met Cynthia and met Jacqueline. He thought she was everything. When she was 18 months old and she tried to say David, it came out with that usual baby talk and it sounded like she was saying Dada. That made things seem even more meant to be. In October 1983, Cynthia and David got married with Jacqueline as the flower girl. Six months after that, David formally adopted her. Most people didn't know David had adopted Jacqueline, and that included Jacqueline. She didn't remember life without him being her father but they knew they would have to tell her eventually, especially since Jacqueline's birth father's family was still involved in her life, even though he wasn't. Jim Guess's mother would call a few times a year to see if Jacqueline could come for a visit when the other grandkids were around. It was important to Cynthia that Jacqueline stay connected to her entire family. She knew it would mean one day explaining the whole story to Jacqueline, especially when she realized how grandparents are related to her, and she has an extra set. But in the meantime, Jacqueline just loved having all these family members to love on her and be part of this big extended family, and it soon grew to include her little brother, Davy, who was born when she was three. In late summer 1987, Cynthia, David, Jacqueline, and Davy moved to Midlothian, Illinois. David's mother, Anna, owned the house, which had a basement apartment. Anna was selling the house to David and Cynthia, and they were sorting out their financing. But they decided to move in early so Jacqueline could start school at the elementary school that she would continue in going forward. So the family of four lived on the main floor of the house, and Anna lived in the basement apartment. It was about a year after moving into the house that Jacqueline went missing. So let's go over the timeline. That's what we do here. September 9th, 1988 was a Friday, and David DeWallaby went to work during the day as usual, and he got home around 5.30 p.m. 
He was home for 30 minutes, and then he headed to a bowling alley about 10 minutes away from the family home, and he got back home around 9.20 p.m. At 9.20, when he got home, Cynthia, Jacqueline, Davy, David's mother, Anna, and David's sister, Michelle, were there. Michelle left shortly after. Around 10.30, Jacqueline and David both went to bed, with seven-year-old Jacqueline taking the Christmas catalog that came in the mail with her. She told Anna she wanted to find presents for everyone in the family. About the time they headed to bed, Anna left. She was going out to meet some friends. She said she went through the back door of the house and checked that it was locked on her way out. Cynthia watched TV until around 11.30. She checked on Jacqueline, who was asleep in her room with the light on. So Cynthia turned the light off and went to bed. At 7.30 in the morning, which would be September 10th, 1988, the alarm clock went off, but Cynthia turned it off when she realized it was Saturday and she went back to sleep. David had planned to get up early to go golfing, but he decided to also go back to sleep. This only lasted until around 8 a.m. when four-year-old Davy came into the room and woke them up. David got up with Davy and brought him into the living room to watch some Saturday morning cartoons while letting Cynthia sleep in a little longer. When he got into the living room, David saw that the front door was open. It didn't really alarm him because Anna had gone out the night before. The basement apartment didn't have its own entrance, so Anna had to go through the main part of the house to get down there. So he assumed she had come home and just didn't close the door behind her. David went to shut the door, and he noticed Anna's car actually wasn't there. But he still assumed she left it open. She must have come home at some point and then left that morning to run an errand or whatever. What David didn't know was that Anna had actually had too much to drink while she was out, so she stayed over with a friend that night. She hadn't come home. Around 9 a.m., Cynthia woke up, and David made her some coffee and brought it to her in the bedroom. Cynthia asked if Jacqueline was up yet, and David said she wasn't, so Cynthia decided to go wake her up. When Cynthia went into Jacqueline's room, she realized she wasn't there. She also noticed that her bedspread was missing. Cynthia and David checked the house real quickly to see if she was in there somewhere and they couldn't find her. So assuming that she had gotten up and went outside to play, they looked around the outside of the house. She wasn't there. So David and little Davy walked to a few neighbors' houses to see if she was there. They looked in backyards that would have something that would draw Jacqueline in, anyone who had a swing set or a play set. When they still couldn't find her, the family got into their truck and drove around the neighborhood, thinking maybe she wandered further out to go play with friends. While they were driving around, Anna came home. After David and Cynthia got back to the house, Anna said she had just gotten home and hadn't seen Jacqueline. So Cynthia walked through the yard to go check a neighbor's house again, and she noticed that one of the little basement windows was broken. The window was still closed and had glass in place, but it was the type of window that opened on a hinge. So someone could have broken the glass, reached in to unlatch the window, and opened it that way to crawl into the basement apartment. This is when they called the Midlothian police, and it was around 10.26 a.m. The police officer who responded was Donald Woodark. When he arrived, he said David let him in and told him that his daughter was missing and that there had been a break-in. He went and looked at the broken window. The broken glass was mostly on the outside, which would indicate someone broke it from the inside, so that seems suspicious. But we are going to learn today that this mystery story trope of where broken glass is found does not always indicate which side it was broken on. But we aren't there yet. At this point, all we see is broken glass in the yard that is suspicious. 
Officer Woodark then went to Jacqueline's room, which he found in disarray. And I'm going to say that's because she's a seven-year-old. She didn't always pick up after herself. Clothes were on the floor. They were hanging out of the drawers. Very much a messy kid room. Jacqueline's bed was pulled away from the wall a bit, and Cynthia and David said that they had done that when they were looking for her and were just really looking everywhere. What if she fell between the bed and the wall? They said the only thing missing from the room, aside from Jacqueline, was her bedspread. Woodark called in the information for the missing persons report and then went back to the basement window. He looked at some of the shards to see if he could see evidence of what was used to break the window, but he didn't see anything. He said he put the pieces back just about where he found them. And now we're going to come to a very important detail. In the initial report dated September 10th, Woodark wrote five times in that report that entry was made through the broken window. 17 days later, he filed a supplemental report saying that he noticed an undisturbed layer of dust on the windowsill, calling into question the conclusion that he made five times in his previous report that someone came through the window. I will say that Officer Woodark wasn't the only one to mention dust. Hayden Baldwin, a state crime scene tech, said that he did a basic search of the DeWallaby house on September 10th, and he said he also saw dust, and he also saw two cobwebs, one in each corner. And this reminds me of the Jean Bonnet Ramsey case and the debate over can you make it through a narrow window without disturbing cobwebs. But unlike the John Bonnet case, we don't have a picture of these cobwebs. Baldwin photographed the window, but not the dust and not the webs. So there isn't a record to even see the size and state of the webs. And it does seem odd to me that if the dust and the webs were so suspicious and so important, why weren't they photographed? Baldwin said he also noted that the basement window that was broken was actually unlocked. So the person breaking in could have just opened it from the outside. I know some windows in my house are difficult to open from the outside, even if they are unlocked, but when the FBI came in the next day to search the house, an agent tried to open the unlocked basement windows, and he said they opened pretty easily. As far as prints in and around the home, there was nothing usable found in the house, though there was some limited printing done. Jacqueline's bedroom door and the front door were checked for prints, but it doesn't look like anywhere else in the house was, which includes the rest of Jacqueline's room and the back door of the house. It doesn't seem they were dusted. There were also no shoe prints found outside the house near the basement window and no indication that they found them anywhere else either. Anytime a child goes missing from their home in the middle of the night, the parents are looked at maybe even more strongly than if a child goes missing pretty much anywhere else. But they did also pursue the kidnapping angle, and a wiretap was put on the family's phone in case there was a call for a ransom. Now, a ransom kidnapping seemed unlikely. This wasn't a wealthy family, but it also couldn't be ruled out. There was also a massive search with helicopters, ATVs, and dogs. On September 11th, the day after Jacqueline was reported missing, David was asked to take a polygraph. He said yes, and he was told he passed it. Cynthia informed the police that she was worried that Jacqueline's birth father, Jim, was involved. And she said she believed he actually had tried to kidnap Jacqueline before, when she was only a month old. At the time, Cynthia and Jacqueline were living with Cynthia's mother. According to Cynthia, Jim had climbed through an upstairs window at her mom's house, but he fled when her stepsister saw him and screamed. Cynthia worried back then that Jim was there to kidnap baby Jacqueline. She called the police, but Jim denied that he had ever gone over there, and there just wasn't enough evidence to charge him. Though Jim didn't have contact with Jacqueline in the intervening years, his mother said it did really hurt him when David adopted her. The last Cynthia had heard was that Jim was living in Florida, but he could be back in town. She didn't know. 
However, when the police ran a check on Jim Gass and his whereabouts, they learned he was in fact in Florida and he could not have traveled to Illinois. He was in prison, which is a pretty airtight alibi. But the police also interviewed members of Jim's family, including his mother and his brother, because this may still have been some type of custody issue. But they denied involvement and provided alibis. A neighbor named Holly told the police that her dogs were pacing and barking at the side door near the Dewalabee's home, which is something they usually didn't do, and it was between 11 p.m. and midnight, the night Jacqueline went missing. This behavior was strange enough that she noted this as odd. Around 2.30 a.m., Holly said she got up to use the bathroom and get a glass of water from the kitchen. From there, she could see out into the Dewalabee's driveway. She looked outside and noticed that there was only one car parked there, the family's blue Malibu. The officer took note of this because the family only said Anna had left overnight. That would have left the car and David's truck in the driveway. So where was David's truck if Holly didn't see it? So the investigation started looking a little more closely at the parents. And by a little more, I mean a whole lot more. But before the case went too far as a missing persons case, Jacqueline's body was found. It was Wednesday, September 14th, 1988, just four days after she was reported missing. A man named Michael had arrived at his apartment complex around 5.45 p.m. This apartment complex was in Blue Island, Illinois, and probably about a 10 to 15 minute drive from the Dewalabi home. Michael found the parking lot pretty full, so he had to park in the rear near a wooded area. When he got out of his car, he smelled something absolutely awful. He looked into the brush area and saw a blanket. So he took a step closer, pushed some branches back, and saw the small arm and head of a child sticking out from the blanket. Though Jacqueline's body was just one or two feet from the parking lot, the brush was really dense here and overgrown. Some of the grass was up to six feet tall. If not for the smell of decomp, people could have walked within feet of her body for ages without ever noticing she was there. For lunch or late night, the cheesy goodness of a quesadilla hits the spot. Amigos invites you to try the bold, fresh flavors of our new Southwest quesadillas. We start with a zesty salsa tortilla that's stuffed with pepper jack and cheddar cheese. Then we add your choice of marinated steak, grilled chicken, or Southwest chicken. The secret ingredient that makes it better than any other quesadilla? Amigos Ranch. As a snack or a meal, grab the new Southwest quesadilla at Amigos. Michael called the police immediately, and they quickly identified the body as Jacqueline's, with the blanket she was wrapped in being the one from her bed. At 6.30 that evening, Cynthia was told that Jacqueline's body had been found. The officers relaying the information said she immediately began sobbing and collapsed. David wasn't home at that point. He was actually with the police being questioned. He didn't believe them when they told him they found Jacqueline's body. He knew they suspected he had something to do with her disappearance, so he thought they were trying to get him to slip up. And they did use what he said against him later on. David asked if she was found in a field and if she was alive, and then he accused them of lying. He said, I guess you think I ought to cry. You know, Jacqueline wasn't found in a field, so that's not terribly incriminating. And since he thought they were trying to trick him, the I guess you think I ought to cry is confrontational, sure. But it also makes some sense in this context. When David got home and saw Cynthia and his mother sobbing, 
he realized they were telling the truth. Jacqueline's body had been found. The officers at the home reported that David then sat down and he did cry. Jacqueline had been found with a long rope around her neck. It was 26 feet long. The rope was thin. It was not knotted, but the autopsy did show that ligature strangulation was the cause of death. Jacqueline had no signs of other injuries or that she had been bound. The bottoms of her feet were clean, showing that she had been carried, and sexual assault could not be ruled out due to the state of her remains. And the other evidence at the scene, as far as signs of sexual assault go, could go either way. Jacqueline's nightgown wasn't torn or interfered with in any way, but there was a pair of white cotton underwear about a foot from Jacqueline's feet. They were clean. They weren't rolled inside out, like often happens when underwear is removed, particularly if they're taken off quickly or by force. There was no semen on them, no blood stains, no tears, no cuts. They were clean. But on the other hand, they were taken off, and there were two hairs on them, one which was a pubic hair. Jacqueline, being only seven, could not have been the contributor. The other hair did appear to be a head hair from her. It just could not be determined one way or the other from what's at the scene in regards to a sexual assault. Fingernail clippings did show some blood, and it was type O blood. That's the same blood type as Jacqueline, Cynthia, and her little brother Davy, as well as 38% of Americans. David DeWallaby had type A blood, so he's pretty much the only one in the house who could be ruled out as the contributor to the blood. Three hairs were found on the rope that was around Jacqueline's neck. Two were most likely her hair, and the other one wasn't consistent with her or anyone else in her family. And while we're on the topic of hairs, the family's vehicles were searched and several hairs were found in the trunk of the Chevy Malibu. Of the 17 hairs, they were able to say that five were likely from Cynthia, which makes sense since it was the car she used the most. One probably came from David and one from Jacqueline. The rest of the hairs were not able to really be matched, and I hate to say matched, hair analysis is cannot be excluded level matching, but these were just inconclusive for one reason or another. There was also no blood or fluids found in the trunk. So here's the thing. Nothing was found in the other vehicles. The neighbor told the police the Malibu was there around 2.30 in the morning, and another neighbor said the car was parked in the same place at 8 a.m. as it had been the night before. The police couldn't prove the Malibu had ever moved that night, but the only evidence Jacqueline was in any vehicle was hair in the trunk of the Malibu, hair that could have been transferred there at any time. The only other piece of evidence tied to the home, and I'm using the word evidence pretty loosely here, was that a neighbor saw little Davy playing with a long length of rope before Jacqueline went missing, and hadn't seen it after she went missing. But he couldn't say for sure it was the same rope that was found with Jacqueline's body, and, well, I mean, people own ropes. They're handy to have. More than one person will own a rope. There was really nothing that definitively linked that rope to the house or to the DeWallaby family. It may have come from the family's garage, but it may have is not beyond a reasonable doubt. And though there was not a lot of evidence, David was asked to take a second polygraph, which he did, and he was told it was inconclusive. Polygraphs are not my favorite thing. They're not my favorite investigative tool. It's not just their accuracy. It's that I find too often they're used or discarded at will, not because of the results, but because the police already suspect or already excluded somebody. It seems like they're just too often used to artificially bolster a case, but then ignored if the results aren't what they want. If David failed those polygraphs, 
I guarantee they would have been used as a reason to keep looking into him. But he passed one, and the other was inconclusive, yet they did not take the foot off the gas even a little bit at this point. And the case against David would get the support it needed when another witness came forward, a man named Everett Mann. He lived in the Islander Apartments, the same complex where Jacqueline's body was found. Everett said he arrived home around 2 a.m. on September 10th. He couldn't find a parking spot, so he drove down to the rear lot. He then did a U-turn and pulled into a parking space. To his right, Everett said he saw headlights turn on near the woods where Jacqueline would later be found. He watched as the car slowly pulled forward and left the parking lot. He said it was a dark-colored, late-model, mid-size sedan. Though Everett didn't see who was driving, he said he could only see the shadow of one person in the car, and he had the impression that it was a man. He said based on the profile, the silhouetted profile he saw, this man had a large nose. Due to a number of lights in the parking lot being out at the time, it was pretty dark that night, and Everett was a significant distance from the car. Everett said he never saw the person's full face, just a silhouetted profile and what he believed was a large nose. On September 16th, two days after Jacqueline was found, Everett was shown five photographs, one being David. Not profile pictures, like how he said he saw the driver, full face photographs. And David's photograph was 30% larger than any of the others. Not only did that make David's picture stand out to Everett, it also made his nose look like the largest one. Everett pointed to David's picture and said the nose structure was similar to the person he saw. On September 28th, the police showed Everett photographs of the Dewalabi's vehicles, which included two vans, a truck, and a light blue Malibu. Everett said the Malibu was closest to what he saw, And that's pretty obvious, since he said he saw a car, and that was the only car in the lineup. Everett had said it was a dark-colored car, and the family had a light-colored car, but with how dark things were and the way memories can get foggy, this was accepted as a small discrepancy. So the investigators were saying, just so we're clear, that it was too dark for Everett to know the color of the car, the shade of the car, but it was not too dark for him to recognize the nose of a person driving the car, the same car he couldn't identify the color of. And we are just going to keep going like that makes any sense. The police kept the state's attorney's office informed of the developments, and when they heard about Everett Mann's identification of David and the car, the head of prosecutions, Robert Clifford, wasn't convinced he decided to run a quick reenactment of what Everett said happened. And in doing this, he realized that there was no way to have seen someone's nose structure from the same distance under the same conditions. While Everett may be genuine in what he believed he saw, it didn't seem supported by the evidence. So Robert Clifford was not convinced this was ready to move forward at all. However, he wasn't the one making that call. Patrick O'Brien was the prosecutor in charge of this case, and he took the evidence to a grand jury. The big pieces of evidence being Everett Mann's identification of David and that the glass shards were on the outside, meaning someone broke the window from the inside, indicating some kind of staging. On November 22nd, 1988, two months after the murder, the grand jury indicted not just David, but also Cynthia DeWallaby for the murder of Jacqueline. The couple was immediately arrested. And then, the day after the arrests, the prosecution received a forensic report telling them that actually, the window was broken from the outside, not the inside. The information presented to the grand jury was erroneous. The examination of the glass looked at the breaks and the marks on the glass fragments. 
it was determined that the window wasn't smashed forcefully, which would have sent the chunks of glass into the house. It was actually punctured, and someone grabbed the chunks of cracked glass and pulled them out. This would have been a quieter way to break a window. It's a way to break a window and not alert members of the household that it was happening. But the prosecution was going to stick with the indictment, even though a major reason why it was handed down was debunked. They were taking this to trial anyway. Before the trial could happen, Robert Clifford, the prosecutor who didn't think the case should go forward, contacted the Dewallabies' defense attorneys and told them that there was a tape recording of Everett Mann's interview. It had not been turned over during discovery. So the defense subpoenaed it from the state's attorney's office, and it was turned over at this point. The prosecutor, Patrick O'Brien, said he hadn't turned it over earlier because he didn't know it existed. Not sure how one prosecutor knew and the other didn't, but it was handed to the defense before trial. And the reason this recording was so important to the defense was that Everett's initial statement was uncoached and unrehearsed. If his testimony at trial changed, or if he strengthened the surety of his identification, the defense could counter him with his first statement. By having this recording, they locked Everett Mann and the prosecution into his fairly vague identification for the trial, which was initially to start in September 1989. But then the trial was delayed when another child was kidnapped in the area, and the kidnapping looked a lot like Jacqueline's. This child, thankfully, walked away alive, so she has not been named, and we're just going to call her Jane. Six-year-old Jane was asleep in her bed in Blue Island, Illinois, on September 2nd. A man entered her home by breaking in a kitchen window. He took her from her bed so silently that her brother in the same room did not wake up and took her to a railroad bridge where he then sexually assaulted her. The man let her leave, and Jane walked home and told her mother what happened. She recognized the man as someone in the neighborhood, and she identified him as a man named Perry Hernandez. 24-year-old Perry Hernandez was arrested and later sentenced to 45 years in prison. At this point, the similarities to Jacqueline's kidnapping were a lot. Jane was kidnapped almost to the day a year after Jacqueline. The railroad bridge was a mile from where Jacqueline's body was found. Perry Hernandez had broken in through a window in the overnight hours. He targeted Jane, who was a neighbor, and it turned out he also used to stay with his girlfriend, who lived a few blocks from Jacqueline. So there needed to be time to investigate this with Perry Hernandez as a suspect in Jacqueline's murder. Both sides needed time to look into this. He did deny involvement in her murder, and neither side could find any solid evidence. So the trial went forward in April 1990, a year and a half after Jacqueline's death, but the defense still planned to use this other kidnapping as an alternative suspect for the jury. But the state said it couldn't have been Perry Hernandez, and it actually couldn't have been anyone else either. They argued that David and Cynthia were the only two people with the opportunity to have killed Jacqueline that night. Anna hadn't been home. Davy was only four years old, and the state said the break-in was staged by the family. We know they don't have the window is broken from the inside anymore, but they did point out that there was a rack below the window that was flimsy enough that anyone landing on it would have broken it. The defense did show that one of the boxes on the rack had a bend in it that could have been from someone stepping on it. There was also a scuff mark on the wall below the window. That could have come from a shoe. And David and Cynthia video recorded a neighbor climbing through the window and avoiding that rack entirely. And without too much effort to try to purposely avoid it. 
But though the neighbor could fit in, the prosecution showed the jury a frame the size of the window to really give them an idea of how small this entry point was. Even if a neighbor could get through it, most people couldn't or they likely wouldn't have even tried. The prosecution also pointed out to the jury some statements David had made that they felt pointed towards his guilt. One is that when David first talked to the police, he said he kissed Jacqueline goodnight, and later on, he actually said he didn't do that. So that's a change in his story. The rest of the statements are nothing that could be construed as a confession, but they fall in that gray area of things that are just kind of odd to have said. For instance, during an interrogation prior to Jacqueline's body being found, David was asked if he knew where she was, and his response to that was, I didn't do it. They asked him if he could find Jacqueline, and he said he could do it within about two weeks, and he would just follow the leads and find her. Then we have that reaction when they told him that they had found her body. He asked if she was in a field, accused them of lying, and made some snarky comment about, I guess you think I ought to cry. But we do know he thought that was an interrogation trick, which really explains why he said it. There are also some comments he made to a friend. Just a few days after Jacqueline went missing, David allegedly said that it was hard at first, but got easier day by day. Jacqueline was still missing at that point. So that does absolutely seem an odd thing to say that it was already getting easier. Then after Jacqueline's body was found, the police searched the home and David allegedly told someone that the police didn't have anything on him. Not that he didn't do it, just that they didn't have anything on him. These statements, I think in a lot of cases with more evidence, wouldn't have even been a blip in the case. They may not have even made it to court because they really don't amount to much. But this case was pretty thin, and they were using whatever they could to bolster it. The strongest evidence at trial was Everett Mann's identification, which he testified to in court. But he did admit he only saw the man's nose at a significant distance on a dark night. There was no moon out. The streetlights were burned out. And this eyewitness identification was literally just the nose. And I hope I was clear on that. Everett said he didn't even know the man's skin color, and he actually only assumed it was a man due to the size of the shape. Yet he could identify the nose. And that's the state's case that was presented. You may have noticed little or no evidence of Cynthia's involvement was presented. It was about David's statements and David's nose. So at the end of the state's case, both defendants made motions for directed verdicts. These are commonly asked for and commonly denied. A directed verdict is when the judge says there just isn't enough evidence for a reasonable jury to find the defendant guilty, so the judge acquits them immediately. In this case, the judge actually granted the directed verdict for Cynthia DeWallaby. The only evidence she was involved was that she lived in the house. But he did allow the case to proceed against David. The defense's strategy was that rather than focus on the evidence against David or the lack of evidence, they were going to focus on third-party culprits. By pointing out the evidence against those culprits, it would show there was not enough against David. Perry Hernandez was brought up. They even had his victim testify to what happened. And they pointed at the similarities between the cases, while the state, of course, pointed to the differences. The defense wanted to put Perry Hernandez himself on the stand but due to his right against self-incrimination in the pending case with the second victim, this was nixed by the judge pretty quickly. The defense also brought up one of Jacqueline's uncles on her birth father's side as another alternative suspect. Of course, the family had been looked into early on, and it was discovered Jacqueline's uncle Timothy had a connection to the apartment complex where her body was found. His ex-girlfriend had lived there, and he was very familiar with it. But the police cleared him when he provided an alibi for the overnight hours, and the people he was out with backed him up. 
David opted not to take the stand in his own defense. In the closing statements, the prosecution gave a theory of the crime. They said that Jacqueline had been tied up by her parents as a discipline tactic. They tied her to her bed, and her death was accidental when she struggled against the restraints. They then panicked and hit her body. An issue with this is that no evidence of abuse was directly presented to the jury. And that was in part because of something the judge excluded. The state wanted Davy to testify. At some point, he told the investigators that his mother had disciplined Jacqueline with spankings and that belts, ropes, and brooms were also sometimes used. But a year and a half later, Davy had to be prodded to remember things from before Jacqueline's death. He was only four when it happened. He just wasn't reliable enough as a witness. And I also don't know if they recorded the interview where Davy said his mother hit Jacqueline or if the person questioning Davy was even trained in interviewing children. Children are incredibly susceptible to being influenced by how a question is asked, and that can lead a child to say nearly anything. So this was excluded, and the prosecutor made the statement about what they thought happened to the jury without evidence backing it up. But it's actually a little worse than that because there is evidence that it didn't happen. It's not that there's just no evidence to support it. If Jacqueline was bound and struggled against the bindings to the point she accidentally strangled herself, there would have been injuries shown on the autopsy. The autopsy explicitly states there were no signs of her being bound. There is evidence saying that this is not how it happened and no evidence saying that it did, and yet it still made it into the closing statement. The jury took the case, deliberated for three days, and in the end, they convicted David DeWallaby of murder in the first degree and concealment of a homicide. Two months after the conviction, the judge handed down the sentence, 40 years for the murder and five years for the concealment of a homicide. But this story isn't over. A juror who stood by the verdict said afterwards that they saw signs of, quote, great violence in the home. By this, she meant they saw a hole in the door that looked like someone had punched it. The state never mentioned this. It was not entered into evidence, but the jurors could see it in the crime scene photos. This non-evidence observation led the jury to buy the abuse story. But the thing is, the damage was there before David and Cynthia even moved in. This was David's childhood home, and that fist-sized hole in the door was from David's younger brother, who got mad when he was a teenager and punched the door. He didn't even live in the home anymore. And this is why evidence has to be tested in court. It has to be looked at from all sides. This juror literally said they used that hole in the door to support their verdict when it wasn't even from anyone who lived in the house when Jacqueline was killed. A journalism professor at Northwestern University named David Protus watched all of this play out, and he reached out to the Dewallabies after the trial. With David still proclaiming his innocence, Protus wanted to write about the family's perspective and let them speak. The Chicago Tribune published the article in two parts in July 1990, and afterwards, a juror reached out to David Protus. She said she had caved in to pressure from other jurors. She regretted finding David guilty. So David Protus saw that there was more of a story here. He pitched it to the editors at the Tribune to tell this juror's story, but they passed on it. So he took this story to NBC Chicago. An investigative reporter named Paul Hogan joined David Protus in exploring this story even more. The biggest things that they found really had to do with Everett Mann and his identification. Seeing as that's really the most solid piece of evidence against David, poking holes in it is huge. For one thing, they learned about this recreation 
where the first prosecutor tried to determine if Everett could even see the man's nose under those conditions. They decided that he couldn't have, but that reconstruction, that information had never been turned over to the defense. They were also able to interview Everett, who said that the prosecutor, Patrick O'Brien, actually had a bigger nose than David, and if his photo was in the lineup, he would have picked O'Brien instead of David. The key witness here is saying that the prosecutor looked more like the killer than the defendant did. Let that sink in. This information really turned the tone of the media reporting on the case and with it, public opinion, which had largely been against the Dewalabies. Suddenly, things didn't seem quite so obvious. But by the time all of this came out, David had already filed his appeal, so he couldn't include it. It may have made it into a second appeal if the first one failed, but the first one didn't fail. The appellate court overturned David's conviction for a number of reasons. One is that opportunity alone cannot support a conviction unless the state can prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, that only one person had the opportunity but the appellate court said someone else had the opportunity, Anna DeWallaby. She said she left the house at 10.30 p.m. and didn't come home until after David and Cynthia realized Jacqueline was missing. However, the police didn't establish anyone who saw her until shortly after midnight. So there was an hour and a half that night that Anna was unaccounted for. Now, that's not to say Anna did this, not even close, just that she could not be ruled out as having the opportunity. And who else had the opportunity? Cynthia, who was acquitted. And the appellate court didn't believe the state had excluded the possibility of an intruder. Perhaps the intruder broke the basement window, realized he wasn't going to fit, and found another entry point. Just because the window was broken didn't make it the final entry point, and people can fit through that window. It's not as tiny as sometimes it has been made out to be. The court also addressed the statements David made prior to his arrest, and the court said that placed in context, none of it could be construed as an admission of guilt. Even if you added them all together, they don't make up a confession. And lastly, the court tackled the issue of Everett Mann's identification. We already talked about how Everett, after trial, had more or less walked back from his ID and how the recreation of the conditions showed he couldn't have seen the man's nose. But the appellate court didn't even have that information in front of them, and they still rejected his identification. They pointed to all the things Everett couldn't identify about the driver. Race, age, facial hair, and so on. All he saw was a nose profile And when he was asked to identify the person in the photo lineup, he wasn't even shown a profile shot. They called the identification doubtful, vague, and unreliable. The court walked through the state's case and just said, no, none of this is good enough to sustain a conviction, either as individual pieces or on the whole. And more than just overturning the conviction and sending this back to trial, They found that the trial judge erred in denying David's motion for a directed verdict when it was granted for Cynthia. They said David should have been granted the directed verdict and acquitted. To remedy for this error, in October 1991, David DeWallaby was acquitted on all charges by the appellate court. The state appealed and also objected to David getting bond in the meantime while the appeal was heard. However, the Illinois Supreme Court set a bond and David was released after spending nearly 600 days in prison. On February 5th, 1992, the Supreme Court rejected the state's appeal. And that was the final word on this case. David DeWallaby was officially not guilty of the murder of his daughter so the legal process was over. But we still have a huge question. Who killed Jacqueline DeWallaby? The case is unsolved. As often happens, the police believed they had it right. And while they would still follow up on leads and tips that came in, they weren't actively working on this case, and that really upset Jacqueline's family. 
After all they had been through, a murderer was still walking free. Unsolved Mysteries took on the case and aired a segment on Jacqueline's kidnapping and murder in November 1992, which was a year after David was released from prison. The Dewalabi sat down for an interview with the show. After the segment aired, two tips came in saying that someone who had been questioned early on had lied about his alibi. This person actually had not been mentioned in the segment, which gives a little bit more weight to these tips. And this was Timothy Guess, the brother of Jacqueline's birth father. The family had been looked into early on, like I said, and Timothy's alibi was that he had been at a restaurant all night. Two waitresses backed him up on this. But now, a few years later, one of the waitresses said she alibied Timothy only because she thought the parents were guilty. She didn't want them wasting their time looking into someone who didn't do it. But the truth was, she only saw Timothy stop by the restaurant briefly at 9.30 that night. David Protis was still doing his investigative reporting on the case when he interviewed Timothy in December 1992. And a very important bit of context here, Timothy had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He had also used drugs since he was a teenager. So he was not a reliable reporter, and he was sometimes aware of that, acknowledging that he had blackouts. But Timothy did believe that he had psychic powers, that a spirit had given to him, when he was 16. And sometimes when Timothy was talking, he said it wasn't him talking, but it was rather the spirit speaking through him. Timothy talked about the layout of the Dewalabi's home, somewhere he had never been, saying that you have to walk past Davy's room to get to Jacqueline's room. But then Timothy said that the spirit told him that, that he had never actually been there, and he hadn't kidnapped Jacqueline. He just knew the layout of the house that he had never been to because the spirit told him. When he was asked why other people said he was not at the restaurant all night, Timothy said he may have been invisible that day, and that is why people didn't see him there. It is so difficult to assess statements made by someone who wasn't always rooted in reality and whose lucidity would come and go. So while all of these statements are interesting in an investigative sense, I do think bigger picture, we have to weigh that against his severe mental illness. After the Unsolved Mysteries segment and the new tips about Timothy, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office did reopen the case briefly, but it didn't go anywhere, and Timothy Guest died in 2002. David Protus's work on the David DeWallaby case kicked off a new path for him. He and his students worked to free 12 people who were wrongfully convicted, including five from death row. And he is currently the president of the Chicago Innocence Project. It all started when he decided to interview Cynthia DeWallaby for an article. And it has been over 30 years since that point, since Jacqueline was murdered, her parents put on trial, and then exonerated. And Jacqueline's killer has never paid for this crime. But even after everything the family went through, the trial, the arrest, losing custody of Davy after the arrest, the trial, the appeal, and living under the shadow of suspicion, even after being exonerated, David DeWallaby has said, absolutely none of it can compare to the pain and grief of losing Jacqueline. For them, that remains the worst part of everything. And if you have any information on the murder of Jacqueline DeWallaby, please call the Midlothian, Illinois Police at 708-385-2534. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Crime Lines is also on YouTube, where I post two to three true crime videos a week, including an occasional after show where we go over any visuals from that week's podcast episode. Crime Lines is also on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crimelines. 
And if you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an occasionally funny history, mystery, and true crime podcast that I co-created and write for. 